أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قالوا تالله تفتأ تذكر يوسف حتى تكون حرضا أو تكون من الهالكين رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه اجمعين أما بعد once again, everyone, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. So um, today's job is to cover some lessons from ayah number 85 of Surah Yusuf. And this ayah is, uh, you know, interesting and unique in the, you know, collection of ayat in the Quran for several reasons. So let's go over some of those reasons first. Okay. Um, so the first of those reasons is that Allah Azza wa typically does not dedicate, like he has here, a pretty long quote from the brothers. Um, that's just about them complaining to their father. Uh, and this has been interpreted in two, two ways. Um, first of all, let's take a step back and understand why that's significant. Why would interpreting, or why would Allah quoting the brothers talking to the father be so important? Let's first look at the translation. They said, we swear to God, Tallahi is an unusual form of saying Wallahi. Are you going to keep mentioning Yusuf? Will you not quit? Remembering Yusuf, hatta takuna haradan until you die sick, aw takuna min al halikin, or you are from those that die, that just get killed, meaning get killed out of grief and out of depression, etc. Okay, this statement can be interpreted in two ways. Firstly, you can think about it as them speaking to their father in anger, right? So they're frustrated that their dad turned his back his back from them. And he just said, oh, my grief over Yusuf, ya asafa ala Yusuf. Uh, and his eyes turned white and he was swallowing, he had swallowing, been swallowing his, his grief for so long. All of that I talked to you guys about last time. So when they saw him turn his back and even Yusuf came out of his mouth, it made them so angry that they yelled at him. And this is an ayah just recording how they yelled at their father. And there's a parallel reading of this, which is actually more popular. The more popular reading of this is that this was them concerned for their dad. In other words, when they saw him crying in grief, to going to a corner, it's almost as if they came and put their arms around his shoulder, one of them, and said, you know, I swear to God, you're just going to, if you keep mentioning Yusuf like this, you're just going to get sick. You're going to be, you're going to die. Is that what you want? So... It, one reading of it is they're being a little bit more consoling to their father in trying to help him get over the, the loss of Yusuf. We're not talking about Yusuf after all now. We're talking about bin Yamin. This is, that's, that was years ago. That's old news. Uh, or they're yelling at him. They're frustrated with him. Now, there are indications in the text of why you would read either one. Are they being consoling or are they being you know aggressive with their dad? Right. So let's first thematically look at that before we get into the you know the text of the ayah and some of its very heavy implications if you look at what would be the reasons why you would think that it is out of affection probably the strongest argument that they spoke to him gently is a couple of ayat later so this is going to be in ayah number 87 he says ya baniya ya baniya idhhabu fatahassasu min yusuf wa akhihi my sons, go and seek out, get a sense for Yusuf and his brother, and don't lose hope in Allah's loving mercy and his care. And certainly, nobody loses hope in Allah's loving care and mercy except those who, you know, the disbelieving people. In other words, the father told him to go look for Yusuf and his brother. He told them to not lose hope in Allah's mercy. Now that seems to be, well, first of all, if they yelled at him for even mentioning Yusuf, why would he bring up to them, go look for Yusuf? Right, that doesn't make sense. So it must be that they spoke to him gently and he saw the opportunity to, uh, you know, to speak to them about this. Plus Allah, is, he, uh, Yaqub is talking to his sons about, alayhi salam, about not losing hope in Allah's mercy. So there seems to be a more positive conversation here, which seems to support that they came to him in a gentle way. And that in corresponding to that, he spoke to them gently also, right? That's so the, the reading of ayah 85 gets influenced by what we're reading in ayah number 87. But what are the counter arguments? So this was the argument of if we were to read this as if they were speaking to him gently when they said, we swear to God, you're going to keep remembering Yusuf until you die, until you get sick and so sick that you're going to be at the, on the verge of death and you might even join those that have died like this. 
you wouldn't be the first to die like this. So please don't do this to yourself. So that's out of concern that they're talking to him like that, right? But what's the other reading of it? Well, the other reading of it is, if you look, first of all, he turned his back from them. So he's not happy with the way they are. And plus he said, Sabrun Jamil, or again, he repeated those same words of frustration previously. Then he's already overwhelmed with grief. And when, when he's overwhelmed with grief, and you read these as words of anger, like, are you serious? You're still going to cry about Yusuf to the point where you're blind? What's next? You want to you wanna die? Is that what it is? You're going to keep on mentioning Yusuf? Seriously, Yusuf? And it angers them that he they hear even his name because the, the entire you know, evil act that they committed was for him to be erased. You know, ardan. Just leave him somewhere far away. Just make him disappear. So long as he doesn't exist, we'll be happy. And where should he not exist? In the heart of dad. يَخْلُوا لَكُمْ وَجْهُ أَبِيكُمْ Early on in the surah, when he goes away, your dad's heart will empty out and the only thing left for your dad is to turn towards you. Because the one that's preoccupying him all the time is gone. Well, after all these years, are, he's still reminding us that we are still number two, he's still number one. In the middle of all this crisis, you're still going to mention Yusuf. So it's like their old jealousy against Yusuf a.s. fired up again. How dare he bring up Yusuf again? Come on already. Seriously, you know, isn't it time that you loved us enough yet? And they start yelling at him out of that anger. This is kind of, it's not so crazy for a lot of people to understand. Some people are very abusive. And they say, don't you understand? I'm yelling at you because I love you. <laughs> I'm abusing you because if I didn't care, I wouldn't be doing that to you. <laughs> some people have it in their head that that's how love works, right? That you hurt someone because you're actually loving them. And they're frustrated with their dad and... We already know early on that at some level they really just want their dad to love them. But they have this all twisted in their head. Now if you read it like that, what else supports that view? Well, I said the, op the opposing view can be supported by ayah number 87. But actually this reading can be more supported by ayah number 86. The immediate next ayah. He said, I'm only complaining. And I'm only taking my grief, my sorrow, my overwhelming sadness. I'm only taking that to Allah to complain. I'm not talking to you guys. I'm talking to Allah. Leave me alone. And I know from Allah something you don't know. Just, I can't have this conversation with you. This is a conversation between me and Allah. Just, haven't you done enough yet? Just leave me alone. Give me some space. Because he's already turned away, right? In the previous ayah. So, this could be a reading that supports that they were being aggressive. They were being unnecessarily abusive. And their frustration not considering what he's going through. And as a result, he turned back to them and said, I'm not complaining to you. I'm not whining to you. I turn my back from you. I'm only talking to Allah. And that would be the reading of ayah number 86. So there are two different views. But then how do you reconcile? If you do say that he was speaking to them angrily, then how would you reconcile ayah number 87? Well, well either way, if you, if you say that they spoke to him gently, then you would have to do a, you know, sort of a different reading of ayah number 86. If you say he speaks to them harshly, then you have to look carefully at ayah 87 and figure out how can we make sense of that, that they have this harsh exchange where they're not talking to each other. He's walking away from them and saying, I'm only talking to Allah. And then he has a, a positive conversation with him right after that, right? So we'll solve that problem when we get to ayahs 86 and 87 tomorrow and day after, inshallah. But for today, let's stick with ayah number 85. And I will be you know, transparent with you in what I find more convincing. Um, though I have respect for both views, I tend to lean more towards the fact that they were in fact harsh towards him. And they were aggressive in the way that they approached this matter because it did poke them. And there are indications in the text already in the surah that it, not, it doesn't take much for them to get aggravated by the memory of Yusuf. Or it doesn't take much for them to speak ill of Yusuf. Yusuf wasn't even being brought up and they brought up that he was a thief. Accused him falsely of being a thief, right? So, and they didn't even speak of their brother as their brother. They said him and his brother, right? So they have this otherness that they associate with Yusuf alayhi salam. Now, um, coming back to the ayah, the first thing of note here is the phrase tallahi. Um, those of you that are Arabic students are familiar that wow al qasam, which is a jarra. Is wallahi, wal asri, wattini, wal fajri. There's so many surahs that begin with the wow that's used for taking an oath in the Arabic language. The Quran uses that in many, many surahs in the beginning, sometimes, sometimes in the middle. Um, 
But then there is the rare occasion of ta. So al kashaf, for example, and as the Makhshari mentions in al kashaf, al ta ufiha ziyada tu ma'nan wa huwa ta'ajjub. The ta includes additional meaning than just I swear by, and that's the meaning of shock, shock or overwhelmed emotion. Wa sallama hu fi ma'na fi mughn al labib. Wa fassalahu al tayyibi bi anna al tayyibi or tibi rather bi anna al muqsam alayhi bi ta yakunu nadir al wuqoo. So what happens with the ta is what you swear by Because you say I swear by And then you add something, right? Uh, the thing that you're shocked about uh, It doesn't happen much The strongest kind of oath that can be taken Is the oath taken by Allah By Allah's name The ta is used when the thing you're going to talk about Is really unusual or it's worked you up a lot. So there, there's different, and let's make this non-technical. Like if you're hanging out with your friends and you're like, oh man, wallahi, I want some ice cream right now. That wallahi is not a very serious wallahi. Like if you didn't get ice cream, you would be fine. And sometimes, you know, friends are joking around with each other. And one friend says to the other, wallahi, I'm going to kill you, man. Well, if you say, wallahi, I'm going to kill you and you don't kill him, that's okay. The angels are not writing against you that... You said wallahi and you have to fulfill the oath and show up at their house the next day with a dagger and say, I took an oath by Allah, what can I do? I don't have a choice. No, it's not like that because when you say wallahi, sometimes you say that casually, right? And the Arabs have been doing that for thousands of years to the point where even the Quran cited it. Allah won't hold you to account for the oaths you just kind of, you know, the swearing by Allah's name that you just say and you didn't really mean it. It just kind of slips out of your tongue, rolls off your tongue, right? But tallahi doesn't roll off the tongue. Tallahi for the Arab is a very serious oath. And that's when the fist has been clinched and the teeth are grinding. And there's some extreme emotion at play where someone says, I mean what I say and I say what I mean. You know, and someone's really upset or really angry or really into what they're saying. And it's the most high form of exclamation that the ta is used. And while the wow can be used for any noun, meaning I swear by whatever, like in the Quran, I swear by time, I swear by the fig, the olive, etc. Human beings cannot use the ta in Arabic literature and of course in Islam for other than the name of Allah. So you only find tallahi. And there are a couple of occasions of tallahi in the Quran. So just to give you an example of one example of tallahi in the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam was a young boy and he was disgusted by his fellow villagers and his family also engaged in the worship of idols, right? And he was just, he absolutely despised the false idols, the false gods that people worshipped. And they had such dedication and so much focus on their worship. And he was so put off by that, that one day he was so angry at them. And you find in the Quran statements that he says, where you can feel his anger towards these pieces of wood. And stone, and you can feel his anger, right? So he says, "Tallahi la akid anna asnamakum." I swear to God, I will make a scheme to deal with your idols. But he doesn't say "Wallahi." He says what? "Tallahi." He dropped a ta on it, like I'm, I mean business. And you know what happens next? What he does with the idols, right? So even as a kid, when he he dropped that "Tallahi," he meant serious business. So "Tallahi" is not said under normal circumstances. Is the point? Right, if the Arab reads Wallahi, they may or may not take that very seriously coming from a human being. Of course, when it comes from Allah, we take all of it seriously. But here, human beings are being quoted, right? And for the Arabs who are not Hebrews, the Hebrews are a different people of a different race, a different language, right? And this is this is Allah translating what they said to each other in Hebrew. They weren't having this conversation in Arabic. Let me make it clear. The original recording of this, if we ever found, you know, that and, and Jannah Allah allows us to watch video footage of what actually happened. So the tafsir of Surah Yusuf would be the actual footage, right? And if that happens one day by Allah's mercy, then we'll see that, that they're not talking in Arabic, right? They're talking in Hebrew. So Allah is translating here. Allah is translating what they said. And when Allah translates, He translates the emotions. Maybe they said much more than that, but Tallahi in the Arabic is enough from Allah to capture all of their emotions and all of their rage in what they said. So if I were to try to translate on paper, I'd say, I swear to God. But if I'm translating in video or in audio, I say, I swear to God. Come on. Tallahi.
No, in in recitation of Quran, you can go through it very casually. It's very calming, and you don't know the Arabic. And you're just ah, oh, mashallah, the ta is so light, and the lafzul jalala, the lam is heavy, and you're just can you know concerned with the phonetics, but the meanings, the scene itself. They weren't standing in front of their dad saying, "We swear by Allah." They weren't saying like that. They were angry. They were enraged. And they even now now you notice also an ironic thing. They when they took the oath to protect Binyamin, Yaqub alayhi made them take an oath by Allah because Allah is sacred, right? So if you don't regard my feelings and you still hate your brother and you have this feeling towards him, maybe your awe of Allah will stop you from doing something wrong. Mawthiqam min Allah. Remember that? And they gave him an oath which is made sacred by the mention of Allah's name. And now in their disobedience of Allah, this is important. I would argue in their disobedience of Allah because Allah taught us a timeless lesson in the Quran, something that's in the Quran but has always been true. Even previous prophets had this. What is it? وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ ihsana Be the best you can possibly be to both parents. And then Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal added in Surah Al-Isra, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ Don't even say uff to them. Uff means an expression of frustration. Don't let them see you're frustrated. Control yourself before your parents. Okay, some parents really test our patience. But is Yaqub one of those parents? I mean, it's even, we're, even when our parents are being unreasonable, we're commanded to exhibit that kind of you know, composure. But what if your parent isn't just even a parent, he's a prophet also. And on top of that, he's the best of parents. He's, if you study parenting in the Quran, I did a study on parenting in the Quran many years ago. And I came to the conclusion that the role model, one of the role model parents in the Quran that's been described, that any parent can get guidance from is Yaqub alayhi salam. Actually, many times giving from father to children, advice being given, Yaqub alayhi salam gets mentioned. And it's, I'm not just talking about Surah Yusuf. That even happens in Surah Al-Baqarah, for example. Am kuntum shuhada it hadara Yaqub al maut any father and any children could have been mentioned. But Allah said, were you there when Yaqub, death came to Yaqub? When he said to his sons, what are you going to worship after I'm dead? After I'm gone? His last words to his children, right? So he's, he's not just any father. He's the father that's been cited in the Quran for all humanity to learn from until judgment day. So it's not, it's not a small thing. What I'm trying to get at is, these sons are so lost in their emotions, even though they're Muslims, and we have to remember that. These are not non-believing children. These are not, you know, we, we think of them as the Jewish people or the Christian people after them. They were the Muslims of that time. They were the people that followed revelation. They were the people who mentioned Allah's name. They're the children of prophets. But when their emotions ran this high, and that jealousy and that rage and that resentment kicked in, then it's almost as if that spiritual truth that's inside of you goes inside a shelf, and that shelf gets locked, and then you say things out of your mouth that contradict your own faith. Your feelings overrun your spiritual truth. They run it over. Maybe it'll wake up, maybe they'll unlock that shelf later. But when feelings are running high, and their feelings are triggered for the wrong reasons, it's not even the right reasons. Well, I was really upset at the time. That's why I said, Tallahi. And by the way, Allah says, I will not hold you to account when you take an oath casually. Right? Remember that? But He said, He will hold you to account over what you mean with your hearts. Does this ayah sound like they mean it with their hearts? Yeah, it absolutely does. They're enraged and they start with, we swear to Allah, enough. Tafta'u tazkuru Yusuf. Now, tafta'u in Arabic is a difficult verb. It's from the Nawakis. And it's actually la tafta'u. Fati'a actually means to cease or to discontinue. And la tafta'u means to not discontinue. Like, you know how in English you say, man, I won't stop doing this until blah, 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 blah. Right? I won't stop doing. Right? So when somebody keeps on relentlessly doing, the English word we use is the word still. Are you still at it? Right? Another way of saying, are you still at it is what? Are you not going to stop that? You're not going to stop, are you? You're still going to keep going, aren't you? So still keep going is the positive phrasing. Not going to stop is the negative phrasing, but coming to the same meaning. Tafta'u is actually conventionally la tafta'u. 
And sometimes in highly emotive expressions, especially in poetry, the poet takes the license in Arabic before Islam to say tafta'u as opposed to la tafta'u to mean the same thing. The bottom line is this. Technically, you can say grammatically tafta'u and la tafta'u mean the same thing. There's lots of grammatical discourse on why that's the case with the shawahid, the evidences. But there's a literary point. And the literary point is normal speech is not the same as emotional speech. Poetry is not normal speech, it's emotional speech. And their, the emotion of their speech, emotional speech tends to be less formal, considers less, less components of grammar, it tends to become you know, concise on some things and overly emph emphatic on other things. And that's what seems to be happening. That's, that is what's happening in the text here. When they say, تفتأو, it's as if they're saying, still? Non-stop? You mention Yusuf? You, and Tadkuru is also an interesting duality of words. Tadkuru means you still remember. And or in a, we could even say nowadays you still miss. Taftaqid in the meaning of Taftaqid. Or you still mention. So remembering is in his heart, right? And he's been, previous I said, he's been swallowing it in his heart. And mentioning is on the tongue. So when you see the word dhikr in the Quran, it's associated with two limbs. It's either the heart or the tongue or both. So when someone is doing dhikr, we say someone's doing dhikr, they're saying something like Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, right? So they're saying something like that. But that means that their tongue is saying it, but it also means what? Their heart is saying it. That's why the remembrance, the Arabic word for remembrance is also dhikr, and the Arabic word for mention is also dhikr. And interestingly, in Hebrew, it's the same. The word for mention and remembrance is actually the same. Anyhow, Dhikr here, what does it mean then coming from their mouths? You're still missing Yusuf? Your feelings haven't changed? What about, where's the room for our feelings? Where are, where are our feelings in your heart for us? So they're not just criticizing what he's saying, they're also criticizing how he's feeling. And this is important because early on, they thought that they can do something terrible to control how he's going to feel or to redirect his love towards them instead of Yusuf. Love is not like a plate of food. If I give him this slice, then there will be less slices for me. Love can go around. You can love all your kids. Love can be shared. And the kind of love you have for one child is not the same as the kind of love you have for another child. They're not substitutable with each other. It's not black and white. It's not a quantifiable thing. But in their minds, so long as he loves Yusuf, there's something missing for what we have, what we get from him. So when the name of Yusuf comes out, and this is the second time it's coming out, because previously he did bring up a little bit passive aggressively, am I, should I, am I to trust you with Binyamin like I trusted you with Yusuf? So Yusuf did get brought up again, right? Enough with Yusuf already. Get over it. You still miss him like that? God, why doesn't he love us? It's the same old question again. And the other, of course, is that he mentioned Yusuf. Oh, no, he didn't. Still, you're going to talk about Yusuf, huh? I swear to God. Yusuf. Until you nearly die. And harad is a, is a difficult word of the Arabic language. Uh, difficult in that it's... It's rare, so it's not found very often in the Qur'an. So what I'm going to do for the word harad, which I, I just translated roughly as, you're almost going to die of sickness. Or you're going to kill yourself out of sickness. But let's dig deeper into this word, because it's a, it's a pretty interesting commentary on the state of Yaqub even as they see it. Because it's the, this is the tongue of the brothers. This entire ayah is Allah quoting the brothers, right? And we're going to learn from, from them. And go back to the beginning of the surah, we have a lot to learn from Yusuf, wa ikhwatihi. In Yusuf and his brothers, there are many signs for those who ask. That's what Allah said early on. So this is one of those ayahs where we're learning just from the brothers. But they're the ones teaching us something. Even in their misbehavior, they're teaching us something. Right? Because the Quran won't just teach us powerful lessons from good people and the good things they do. Allah will also teach us remarkable lessons and wisdom from people that didn't do such great things. People that spoke back to their parents, yelled at them even. Carry harbored feelings towards someone they already did wrong to. It's not enough that you did wrong to them, you still hate him. You still can't stand the mention of him. Allah will teach us about that state of the heart too. So, Tallahi, Tafta'u, Tafkuru. And by the way, it's a really interesting thing. If the remembrance of Allah is in the heart, then that remembrance of Allah, what does it do? It heals the heart, doesn't it? 
So it heals the heart of jealousy. It heals the, heals the heart of rage. It heals the heart of anger. It can heal the heart of many of those things because the remembrance of Allah is a, is a cure. Tatma'innul qulub, Allah says, by remembering Allah, hearts become at ease. Well, they just remembered Allah by saying tallahi, but their hearts are not at ease, right? One of the things we're learning in this ayah is you can remember Allah and your heart can still not be as, at ease. That means there's something wrong in the way you remember Allah. There's something wrong in the way I invoke Allah. Maybe the remembrance of Allah is on my tongue, but it's not reaching my heart. I'm not really thinking about the words that I'm saying. When I'm not conscious of the phrases I utter that invoke Allah. And clearly that's the case with them. They're not conscious of the words. They're, you know, if they realize the weight of what they're saying, they wouldn't be saying it. Tallahi tafta'u tathkuru Yusuf. And the other remarkable thing here, there's so much to learn here, is that they just said this in anger in you know thousands of years ago in some village out in Canaan with a in a in a in a house that's probably not very well built with you know no recording devices and no historians documenting and thousands of years later Allah decided that those words that were so outrageous that no police came and gave them a fine nobody recorded it and said I can't believe you said that nobody brought no human being brought it up again and Allah decided, no, this is a crime. And what that, what that teaches you is sometimes words are very serious crimes. And they happen and they go unchecked. Yeah, I said it, so what? I was mad. And people feel like they can say whatever they want and they get away with it. And it's just family. Eh, this, these things happen in family, it's okay. It's not like I said it outside. You know, family, you know, fights happen. It's, it's normal. Mm, is it? Because if it was so normal, Allah wouldn't take... Something so trivial and something so, you know, something to pass by and include it in the revelation that will be recited until Judgment Day to teach us some things you think are trivial, but they're not trivial. Some things you think are no big deal because you just said something because you were upset, but they are a big deal. Be careful of what you say. Know that Allah is recording it to the point where He will, he will even translate it into different languages. <laughs> Here he translated it into the final revelation So all of us can know What's going to happen on judgment day When all of our deeds are going to get translated All of them are going to be recorded All of our conversations are going to come out Full bloom, every word that came out of our mouths لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة It leaves out nothing small, nothing big إلا أحصاها, except that it recorded it This is why we have to ask Allah's forgiveness Because lots of poor things have come out of our mouths You know Tallahi tafta'u tadkuru Yusuf they're going to keep mentioning Yusuf And it's, to me there's also a level of audacity in, you, in using his name By them I would think when you've done something like that to him You should be ashamed to even use his name You know Or you would You should just become You should remember what you did to him And just become quiet Like we did that Like if dad walked away and said Oh my grief over Yusuf and you were part of the team that helped hurt Yusuf alayhi salam, you should just put your head down in shame at the time. Because you know, when you're reminded of what you've done wrong, even indirectly, then it should remind you of how much you need to ask Allah's forgiveness and atone and make things right. But when the devil really gets you, man, when you're reminded of your mistake, you turn it into the other person's problem who reminded you of it. And they weren't even reminding you. He says, I was just talking to Allah, right? I was just talking to Allah And the truth is you did do something wrong And you never made it right And you're still lying about it And you're, you're mad at me for bringing it up? You're mad at me for even remembering him? I'm not even bringing him up to you I'm not accusing you of anything But you know that guilty conscience? Well, the guilty conscience can be used to turn towards Allah And cry and seek forgiveness and make amends And make confessions if, need, if confessions need be made And that other guilty conscience The devil can come and attack that same guilty conscience And say, hey why do you have to feel guilty? You don't have to feel bad. This, this person is making you feel bad. You should put them in their place for making you feel bad. You have a right to be to stand up for yourself. There you go. So now they, it's like they're thinking they're standing up for themselves. But what is it that they're actually doing? The, the, the sin that they committed has been erased. And they've glorified to themselves that they are a victim now. They're a victim of the mention of Yusuf. You see how it's, the, 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 the script has been flipped? In Urdu, they have a saying, Ulta chor kutwal ko dante. Like the, the, the thief who got arrested is yelling at the cop, Hey, why you got to arrest me for? You don't see no other criminals? <laughs> right? 
That's the mentality. And that's a very powerful thing to record in the Quran because it's not just about that story, is it? How many people have experienced that in their life? That people who commit wrong, when they are called out, or even if they feel like they're being called out and get paranoid, they get on the offensive. They, get, they say something's wrong with you. Something's wrong with everyone else. What I did, can't even, don't even bring it up. Don't you dare bring that up. Get over it already. And you know, you know, you're gonna keep mentioning that until what's gonna happen? And you know, we all have parents, we all have loved ones, and you don't talk to an older, hurt, sad, broken loved one that you just you just lost his other son. And his th the third son is missing. He's still back in Egypt. We don't know what's happening with him. And you're telling him, well, you want to die? You're going you're gonna to act like this until you die? How ruthless is that? How heartless is that? That you have no pity on a man in that state who's crying in grief of his pain. And he's never cried. He's never opened up to them like that. Not, the words haven't come out of his mouth. How do we know that? Because Allah says, وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ وَفَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ his eyes turned white, he cried out for he had been swallowing it for a long time. So he takes it and takes it and takes it and the one time he opens his mouth, you avalanche on him. You just drop it on him. How dare you? How dare you express your emotion? It hurt my feelings that you are hurt by what I did. <laughs> you better apologize. What do you want to kill yourself? Is this how you want to stay all the time? So you just die? So now let's look at this word harad and see what they're actually saying. Com uh, as I said, a complex uh, verb uh, in the Quran and a root letter in the Quran. So it, it's tied to a couple of things. So first, I'll, as I list this to you guys, you'll see that maybe things aren't so related to each other. But we'll try to you know tie everything together. Al ihrid al usfur. So ihrid uh, is used from the same letters hara and lad. Is used for um, in the ancient days they used to burn certain material to make plaster out of them, like nowadays kind of cement. But they used to heat it to make it pasty And then used, they used to plaster it And it wouldn't come off it, Like it sticks to the wall That's called ihrid So that's one Thawbun muharrad masbuhun bil usfur Of clothes that have hard on them Or tahrid is done to them What that means is That they have been dyed with a color And the color won't come off You're starting to observe a theme When something sticks or blends in Or immerses into the other material And it won't come out easy Right? That's the kind of the, the theme inside the word harb. Well, harb bil fat wa bil dam hurd shajar al ushnan. Ushnan or ashnan is a skinny, withering plant, a green plant found some parts of Jordan, Syria. Um, I, you know, Sheikh Sohib actually did research on the origin of the plant and its scientific name. Uh, I think I have it here. Uh, my pronunciation is going to be epically terrible, but I'm going to read this to you. Sidelitia. Rosemarinus is a perennial, perennial green desert species of saltwort that is endemic to the lower Jordan Valley and goes on and on. Anyway, but anyway, the, the point is it's a skinny green plant that's found withering in the desert, but it survives in the withering desert. And it's used, it's its extract is used to make dye, like saffron. So and, and the kind of dye that won't come out easy, right? And then the other interesting thing is it's also used to make a kind of soap to remove the dye. So it's used to make color that won't come off. And it can also, it's also, the word is used for things that are used to remove dye or to remove the color or scrape it off, okay? Uh, so these are some of the meanings of uh, harb. Now there's what seems like an unrelated meaning and then we'll try to tie all of these together. Um, uh, a hurda is a person that has been assigned to deal the arrows uh, Because the Arabs when they used to gamble They used to use arrows to gamble So let me give you a modern equivalent It would be like the guy that's dealing the cards At a deck I don't know why I know how to do this But uh, <laughs> that guy would be a modern hurda Right? The guy who's dealing the cards Right? So um, that's another implication from the same root Now having said that from it comes the word harud. Now we get to the word harud when it refers to a person. And that's kind of what they're using for uh, Yaqub alayhi salam, right? So this is going to be a longer read, but I'll read every part of this and translate it for you. Al-harad, muharraka, alladhi adabahu al-huznu wal-ishqu wa alaha alayhi al-marad 
فَأَشْرَفَ عَلَى الْهَلَاكِ This is someone who has been overwhelmed and overrun with sadness and love at the same time and uh, that has led him to a disease that brings him almost to death is a person who's harad. They say al-harad as-saqit alladhi la yaqdiru, yaqdiru ala nuhud is someone who has fallen and cannot get up again is a harad. Maridan um, mushfiyan ala al-halak someone sick almost about to die like a terminal case. Rajulun haridun fasidun fi jismihi wa aqlihi a person who is harid is someone whose whose body and his mind have significantly deteriorated. So you know how people when they are in the ICU or they're on certain kinds of medications or they're going in and out, they're, they're sometimes hallucinating, right? They're, they're sitting next to their, uh, their daughter and they're calling them their sister and things like that. Like they see someone who's not there kind of thing. So that's also a person who is harid. وَقِيلَ الْحَرَدْ مَنْ أَذَابَهُ هَمٌّ أَوْ مَرَضٌ وَجَعَلَهُ مَهْزُولًا نَحِيفًا uh, it's said that someone who, for whom feeling, want, longing, missing someone, sickness has made a person completely incapable, almost paralyzed, and skinny, like they become skin and bones, like they they lose a lot of weight. وَقَالَ ابْنُ إِسْحَاقَ الْحَرَضُ الْفَاسِدُ الَّذِي لَا أَقْلَ لَهُ Ibn Ishaq says harad is a person who's gone, something's gone wrong with them, and they have no ability to think anymore. وَقَرَأَ الْحَسَنِ الْبَصْرِ حُرْضًا Hassan al-Basri read this as hurdan or hurudan rather, بِضَمَّتَيْنِ uh, he says this is the kind of qualities for a person that is completely alien Like someone so, you know when you see someone who got so sick You don't even recognize them when you see them Like they're a completely different person That would be called a hurud also uh, It's argued that the essence of harad Is the corruption of the body and the mind Because of sadness and love together تَأْوِيلُهُ أَفْسَدْتُهُ وَأَحْمَيْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ And حَرَّدْتُهُ حَرَّدَ is means, means to incite or to make someone do something And well, that seems unrelated But we're going to try to tie all of this together Now let me, before I read, you know um, Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi and his four opinions on harad Which is really good, like concise overview of what harad could mean uh, I want to tie some of these things that I mentioned to you Like the dye and the thing that takes the dye off And the guy that cast the arrows. Usually in Arabic, these trilateral roots, these judur, they have a variety of meanings and in some interesting way, some anthropological way, they're all tied together in some unique way. And sometimes some scholars are able to discover those connections, other times they're not. Sometimes those connections are very obvious, others it's a creative exercise, right? First of all, it seems very clear that it's lughatul abdad, which means sometimes a word carries its meaning and the opposing meaning at the same time. So harad gives us the meaning of something that sticks and doesn't let go. And harad also gives us the meaning of something that's being pulled off, like soap scraping off the dye from the material, right? It also, from it, from it, the idea of pulling off came the idea of encouragement or inciting someone to do something, harrada. Like harridil mu'minina al qital, meaning they have the motivation to fight inside them, but there's there's layers of fear and you know, uh, uh, hesitation and doubt that are in front And the Prophet is being told Harid, like pull that motivation to fight out of them And that's incite them Like the soap is going to pull the dye out And leave the pure material behind Right, so that's the, that's the imagery of tahrid I didn't see a direct connection of the guy who deals the cards Hurda and this, but I have an active imagination, Allahu Alam. So I'll just share with you what I what I imagine this could mean. It could mean because gambling is associated with a lot of depression and near death experience. For most people that that uh, gamble lose, right? If most people won, then gambling wouldn't exist, right? The majority of people who gamble lose, and sometimes they lose life savings and they they lose you know their hopes and dreams, etc. And so the societies that have a lot of gambling have a lot of other crimes, uh, have a lot of Debt, for example, have a lot of suicide, for example, have a lot of murder, for example, because it's associated with death. And because harad is something that brings you really close to death, the guy who deals the cards, is it, it's as if he's dealing people's deaths, right? Because hurda is being com coming close to death or you know, bringing people closer to insanity, right? So it's interesting. Um, that reminds me of something I, I noticed. I taught Arabic in Las Vegas in 2003. I swear to God, I went there to teach Arabic. Um, so they have a masjid there, and I, you know, taught Arabic for the, a while, and I kind of observed some of the things in, you know, this that city and that society. Um, and 
I'm, I'm good friends with a you know few people there, and one of them is a very you know well-known doctor in the area, and works in several hospitals there. And he told me a few things about you know their uh, their system. He said there are more cardiologists and more psychiatrists in that city than any other, and it's because there are more people having heart attacks and more people having complete psychotic breakdowns in Las Vegas than any other place. <laughs> you know, they won't advertise that. But doctors know what's up, right? <laughs> because the, these guys that are in these casinos dealing cards are literally dealing out heart attacks, aren't they? Somebody's losing their life savings. Somebody's giving away their mortgage. Somebody's giving away their children's college fund. You know, they're, 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 this is what they're doing with their lives, you know? And so it's uh, it, that, that may be the connection between Harad. Now, coming back to what was said about Yaqub alayhi salam. They're noticing in him that he's getting skinny, he's losing weight, that he's becoming near paralyzed. You're to the point where you can barely walk. There's going to come to a point where you fall, Nahif, la yaqdiru ala nuhud. You're not going to be able to stand up again. Remember these meetings we went through? You're getting to the point where you're going to lose your mind. You're starting to sound crazy. You know? And Because now they're accusing him of being crazy to the point where this is the kind of craziness that takes over someone right before they die because they're hallucinate. Why? Because he's missing Yusuf. So he's being guilted for feeling what he feels. And the one that should feel guilty is them, but they're really good at making him feel guilty. And this is one of the most powerful psychological crimes that exists within families. The people who, are, who should be guilty are masters at making you feel guilty. Are masters as at making you feel bad for even feeling bad because they are masters at trying to control how you feel. You can't feel sad. How dare you feel sad? Get over it already. What's wrong with you? The the man this is you know, I'm baffled by the, the wording in the surah. This is the man that the Quran quotes with what words? Sabrun Jamil. Those words came out of his mouth. And he's being yelled at as if he doesn't have patience. Come on, have some sabr, get over it. So they say, Yusuf, haladan, Or you'll become from those that die. And hal halak actually means to die a violent death. We don't have a word for that necessarily in, um, in English. Uh, you know, it's not killed because when you say killed, it actually means someone killed you, right? So it's a passive uh, word. But to die a violent death or die an ugly death is actually halak. It's different from maut. So when they, and they say, well, they don't say, until you become so sick, you can't stand up, you'll lose your mind, you'll nearly come to death. And then they add, not, and you will die. They say, and you will be from those that die, die a violent death. What are they saying? There's so many people that go down this road you should learn. Like, haven't you seen those people that die like that? They're, they all of them died, right? You want to be another number in that statistic? Irony at its best here, because it's as if they're saying, "Learn from the mistakes of others who felt like this and died terribly. Learn from those who perished before you. Learn from their mistakes." Who's saying that again? The brothers of Yusuf are telling their father to learn from the mistakes of others? <laughs> You'll be from those who die? Um, how about you look, learn from your mistakes? How about you think about what's going on with you? Where are your feelings coming from? How, how about the shaitan and his never-ending jealousy for Adam and you, and you infected with the never-ending jealousy against Yusuf? How about that? The Qur'an quotes this audacity and dedicates an entire ayah just to this. I, you know, often I talk about the style of storytelling in the Qur'an. And Yusuf is the climax of storytelling in the Qur'an. And you would think that it, because the Qur'an is so selective in what it shares, that Allah would... You know, he, he would only talk about the parts of the story that are kind of like the major milestones in the story that help us understand what's coming next, the major events. Um, this small exchange between Yusuf and 
or Yaqub and his sons, is not a pivotal moment in the story. This is just a conversation they had. I mean, the the real thing that happened, the highlights are they went to Egypt, they came back from Egypt. They went to Egypt with their brother, they came back without two brothers. Then they're going to go back. That's the highlights. Right? And there's tons of conversations that happened in, the, in that time. That travel was a long travel. They must have had thousands of words to share with each other. The way back, the time they stayed, the time they ate, they lived together. They're having lots of conversations with each other. But Allah decided that his Quran should have an ayah about their aggressiveness towards their poor father. And if you compare this to the previous ayah, Allah was acknowledging the pain that he had been suffering all along, even when he was quiet. You notice Allah says, he turned his back from them, which was an expression of his sadness. He said, oh, my grief over Yusuf. Ya asafa ala Yusuf. Because the trauma came back. Remember I told you about that? The third was his eyes turned white. And then Allah says, and from sadness, and fahuwa kadhim, and he had been swallowing it all along. So who is empathizing with the emotional state of Yaqub for all those years? It's Allah Azza wa Jal. And who lives with that, him and can't see it? Can't see his pain? His sons. Instead of seeing his pain and being ashamed and trying to do something to alleviate his pain, in fact, they turn back and they get aggressive with him. Again, there is the other reading where they're saying this sympathetically. But I'm more inclined towards the angry reading. Because it's more in line with all the other elements that have been described of the brothers and the kinds of things they've done and said. And the way that they've spoken about their father. And the way that they've spoken... You know, because they are early on, they said, Inna mubin. Our dad is clearly confused. He's lost. Aren't they coming back to the same point? You're going to lose your mind? They're coming back. It's, it's re reiterating their sentiment. So it's, it's more in line from what I can tell Allahu A'lam in that reading of the story that they're talking to him in this way. And in doing so, Allah has captured, uh, you know, kind of a relief for people that are in that position. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's two of us in the audience. Uh, there's some of us that are recipients of this kind of abuse. And there are others of us that are perpetrators. We do this kind of abuse. And maybe we're a little bit of both. And the, when you read something like that and you ponder something like that, you and I shouldn't be thinking, man, I can think of like 10 people who did this to me. Oh my God, I'm going to send them this clip and I say, watch from you know minute number 48 or whatever. That's you. <laughs> right? But we don't think of ourselves. The thing is, human beings are complex. We have good in us, we have bad in us. We may have been guilty of some of this and not realize it. Because they're so lost in their emotions, they don't see what they've done. They don't see how they invoked Allah's name. They don't see that they're hurting their father. They don't see they're committing something so big. You know, Allah says, uh, what is it? You assume it to be so light, but it's so grand before Allah. It's such a big deal before Allah. But you never realized it. So maybe that's us. Maybe we didn't realize it. Maybe I didn't realize it. Maybe you didn't realize it. When we said certain things that were so hurtful, so disregarding, you know, so and and they gloss over our own wrongdoing to focus on the other person who's actually rightful in what they're saying, but to make them feel bad. Because I don't want to face my own guilt. This is a psychologist, maybe will look at this and say, This is a person trying to not confront their past. Because if they actually stopped and thought about what they did, maybe they would have a breakdown. Maybe they're too scared to confront what they did. You know, some people, when they do something messed up, they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to think about it, they don't want to deal with it. Because if they deal with it, they might have to realize how terrible they, what, what they've done. And that, that might make them have a bad judgment of themselves. And this is the last thing I'll share with you. Just because you did something really messed up in your life, confronting that doesn't mean that you realize you're a messed up person. It just means you realize you did something really messed up. What you did and who you are are two different things. They're not the same thing. If you were com completely defined by your past actions, Toba would have no point. It would have no point. Fir'aun, who killed babies multiple times, genocidal maniac, who enslaved people, called himself God. I can't think of someone who hurt humanity more 
and then was blasphemous against Allah more, which is why Allah made him such an epic example in the Quran over and over again, right? Talk about Allah picking on somebody to be the, the role model for bad example, bad behavior, was is Fir'aun in the Quran. And even about him, Allah says there was hope in him. Maybe he'll turn around. Maybe he'll come up. Why? Because your past actions don't define you. The only one whose past actions he allows them to define himself is Iblis. Because he has no hope of changing. He has no hope of reform. He sees no good in himself. And you know what? He wants to convince you and me that if we were like the brothers of Yusuf, if we did something terrible, shameful, I can't believe I did that. Then instead of running from that, if you actually acknowledge that I was in that dark place, I did this. I messed up. I did this wrong. I have to come to terms with that. And I need to do whatever needs to happen to fix it, to make it right. Because the, the victory from Iblis isn't just that you ignore what you did or you beautify what you did or you justify what you did. But even if you face what you did and as a result you become hopeless, that's also not okay. That's also not okay. Because that's also another a powerful trick of shaitan is to make human beings hopeless. Is to make them think, oh, you're going to make tawbah? Shakal dekhi apni? Have you seen your face? This is the face of someone who makes tawbah? Seriously? If people knew what you did, yeah, if people knew what you did, it would be unforgivable. But it's not people that you, whose forgiveness you're seeking. It's Allah's. Reforming yourself. Stopping the wrong that's happened. Doing what you can to make right. And even if you try to make things right, it may be that people don't forgive you. That may be the case. So, so what? If they forgive or not forgive doesn't determine who you are now. It can be a statement about who you were and how much they're hurt. That's fine. But it doesn't define who you are now. This is why we're given a new life every morning. Alhamdulillah, the ahyana ba'dama amatana. Alhamdulillah, the one who gave us new life after he gave us death. That person that you were that did messed up stuff died. A new one was born this morning. And you thanked Allah for that new that, that rebirth. Allahu yatawaffal anfus hina mautiha. You know, Allah takes the, the people at the time of their death. And then He says, and those who don't die, He takes them in their sleep. We die every night. Ba'dama amatana. Wa ilayhi nushur. Who gave us life after He had given us death. We don't make the dua, Alhamdulillah, the one who woke us up after He put us to sleep. We make, we make the dua, Alhamdulillah, the one who gave us life after He gave us death. That's the, that's the acknowledgement we make every morning. So, yes, there is, you know, our thoughts will go towards those that may have done such wrong. And then dig their heels in and turn the tables and become defensive or even aggressive. Yes. But we also must think about ourselves. And we also must think, why would it be so hard for them to just accept what they did? Are they really that evil? It may not be evil. It may even just be fear of facing what you did. It may just be that if I see that, then I'm just going to have such a low opinion of myself like I shouldn't even exist. You know, that it, it might come to that. And we're going to see, I'm giving myself away here, and I'll conclude with this. We're going to see that Yaqub has deep insight into his children. And it seems he knows that this aggressiveness is masking a deeply seated guilt that they're not able to face, come to terms with. And he's actually going to address it. He's not going to address what he hears from them, he's going to address what's behind it. And that's the wisdom of a father, isn't it? He doesn't, a parent doesn't just see what my children are saying and what they're doing. They see the feelings, the thought process behind it that needs to be addressed. It's not the behavior that needs to change. It's the thinking, the feelings that need to be guided. And when they're guided, the behavior changes itself. We keep going after the branches. We got to go after the root. When the root is fixed, the entire plant is fixed, right? When the heart is fixed, the whole body is fixed. That's what we're going to learn from Yaqub in a couple of days. But tomorrow, we're going to see how immediately he's going to respond to them about himself. He's going to draw a boundary for himself. Before you help someone else, I keep saying I'm going to end it, but now I'm really going to end it. Before you help someone else, you've got to help yourself. You've got to draw a line about you can't get, you can't get walked all over. In ayah number 86, he's going to draw a boundary for himself. And once he draws that boundary, then he's in a position to help them. You are not helping anyone if they're walking all over you. You're not helping anybody. Not until you draw a line for yourself. Not until you do that. And that, that's also something we're going to learn 
in the remarkable words of Yaqub alayhi salam recorded in Allah's perfect book. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to give you a Walid farewell.